This is the Entrepreneur Way with Neil Ball. Unlocking the secrets of successful entrepreneurs seven days a week. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Napoleon Hill said the power of the mastermind is the driving force. To discover how you can unlock the potential in your business using the power of a mastermind, go to mastermindunlimited.com. And now, here is your host, Neil Ball. Hello, everybody. Neil Ball here. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Entrepreneur Way. The Entrepreneur Way is about the entrepreneur's journey, the vision, the mindset, the commitment, the sacrifice, failures, and successes. I'm so excited to bring you our special guest today, Tom Hunt. But before I do, I'm going to give you something to think about. David Packard said, take risks, ask big questions, don't be afraid to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not reaching far enough. The Entrepreneur Way is about asking questions and we like to get the insight and the inspiration and the ideas that we can apply in our businesses by asking those questions. Tom, welcome to the show. Are you ready to share your version of The Entrepreneur Way with us? I am ready. Brilliant. Tom Hunt is a TEDx speaker, a Dragon's Den failure, and a location independent founder of Virtual Valley. So, Tom, can you provide some more insight into your business personal life to allow us to, the listeners, to get to know more about you and what you do? Okay. So, up until I was 23 years old, I felt like I just followed in a sort of template life that was set out for someone that was born at the time that I was born in the place that I was born. And it sort of felt like I just followed the herd blindly up until this time through school where I studied hard and got good grades through university where I studied chemistry and received a 2-1 from Imperial College in London. From then moving into the corporate world in London where I worked as a management consultant for three years. And it didn't really feel like I ever really connected to what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I I enjoyed studying chemistry, but it wasn't really my passion. I enjoyed aspects of the work that I was doing Mm -hmm. in the the corporate world and in in the city of London. But I, I never really felt, I guess the word is passionate. Until uh, me and my friends had an idea on the bus returning from a Halloween party in October 2012. We actually wore tights, some very uh, well-patterned and colorful tights to a Halloween party. Uh, Felt really comfortable, looked really good, and actually had the idea on the bus on the way back we should sell these. Obviously, you can't really sell tights to men because they are partially see-through, so we thought leggings would work. And I'm sure loads and loads of different people, or I've previously had loads of different ideas like that that you just just thought messing around with your friends and you come up with. The only difference with this one was that one week later, we were stood at a very cold market stall in Brick Lane Market in East London with 22 pairs of female leggings that we had purchased from eBay, tipexed our logo onto to make them male and had purchased a spot on the stall for, I think it was £150. So we then proceeded to stand around on this stall attempting to sell these leggings for eight hours. And this was the 22nd of December in 2012, so it was cold. How many pairs do you think that we sold? Wow. How could I guess? (laughs) Ten? We sold zero pairs. (laughs) (laughs) But we had a good time. And on the way back from the market, we, because we had such a good time, and maybe because we had like a couple of beers in the afternoon, we decided that we were going to carry on. And so in the next two months, we found a supplier in China, designed our own actual mail leggings and set up a simple e-commerce store on the Mm domainstitchleggings.com. And so that was the start of 2013. And 
I, I, I think I'll end like my history here. I, I'm sure we'll get onto other areas uh, in, for, in future questions. But the, the reason I told that story is because it was at this point that while I was, while we were on the stool, while we were working with the supplier in China, while we were building the e-commerce site, they actually felt passionate about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So it was this first taste of creating something for yourself that will help people uh, that sort of set me on the path since then, since the start of 2013, to where I am now. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about where you are now? Mm -hmm. So I currently... I, I, I have a problem with focus. So I, for the past three years, I've started probably 12 different online-based businesses, um, right. but I've become aware of my tendency to lose focus, and for the past six months, I've focused on one opportunity. And this is a uh, online marketplace that connects entrepreneurs with people in the Philippines that want to work for these entrepreneurs. Yeah. And this marketplace was born out of the previous business which was an outsource service company mm -hmm. and so, so that was me providing people in the philippines to work with startups in london that couldn't afford to hire people in london full time so i in that business i was the middleman and we charged maybe double the, the salary of the filipino and that money went to our company and i provided sort of advice mm -hmm. and consulting on how they could outsource and I was like always there like helping them out no, okay. this was actually the company that enabled me to leave the corporate world because we scaled to six clients um, and we, I had like a sufficient revenue for that company to put to replace my salary mm -hmm. uh, however that model was I, had, I hadn't really and this comes down to the, the definition of the word entrepreneur I hadn't really built a business I built myself a job mm. So I was part of this system that was creating value. I was not sitting above the system uh, and sort of tweaking and improving. If I walked out of that company, then everything would fall to pieces. So I decided to stop marketing that business and to build a system where I would sit above and the system would run without me and I, I was there to improve and to tweak. And so that, so we moved from the service business to the marketplace and we launched this marketplace a week ago today, actually. And now, as an entrepreneur, you can join the platform, create an account, hire a team member in the Philippines within five minutes and seven clicks, I think we calculated. Um, you can then take that team member from the platform. You can view the contact details of that team member once you've hired them by validating your PayPal account. You, you then work with them off the platform, and our software tracks all of the time that that person spends their active time, which is whether they're on the keyboard or moving the mouse, and also some screenshots from their, from their screen. Mm -hmm. All of that data is fed back to the dashboard that you can log in and see as an entrepreneur. Then automatically at the end of the month, the amount of time they've charged is multiplied by the hourly rate that you agreed when hiring, and then that amount is reviewed and then taken from your PayPal account. Wow. That sounds fantastic, so that, actually. Thank you. I mean, if you think I, I've I've done outsourcing before, and obviously you never really know how long it takes somebody to do something. So to have a system that actually tracks what they're doing whilst they're doing it, that sounds awesome. So Tom, can you just? I mean, what, one of the things that I said in your, what your introduction was, I talked about you being a dragon's den failure. So mm -hmm. uh, that might be worth just talking about a little bit if you could, please. Yeah. So I think I I put the word failure in like exclamation marks. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> so we have these words that we use and we assign each person assigns a different meaning to these words that we use yeah um the word like my definition of the word failure well I, actually i don't really have a definition of the word failure because i don't really believe it truly exists no to, to call something a failure you, you i think you have to uh impose completely arbitrary time boundaries to an event yeah uh which I believe there's no point in doing. So yeah, if you looked at our Dragon's Den appearance, and we can put a link to the YouTube video yeah. in the show notes below, I guess. Um, if, if you took that 30 seconds or the, the 15 minutes we're in the den and you looked at it at an event that occurred in time, yes, you could say that as a failure. Yeah. But then if you extrapolate over the next year, over the past year, um, 
the, the definition will potentially change. So, I, yeah, I, I can tell the Dragon's Den story. We, so we've been running after the market stall incident. We spent a year selling these leggings online, and we, like, we were all working full time. So we spent a couple of hours a week, and we managed to sell 150 pairs through our website. At the end of that year, I was sat like on a sofa on my iPad, just sort of browsing the internet, and I stumbled across the Dragon's Den website, saw that you could apply, wrote out our application and sent it in in about 15 minutes. Um, something about the application must have resonated with the people that uh, managed the applications, and we actually got invited to submit more information and then go to the BBC studios to audition. Uh, so we did that, and throughout the process, they were, they were saying that like we're probably taking a big risk on you. We have no idea how the dragons will react. Mm -hmm. But we were more than happy to, to continue. We knew that if we did get on the show, we would be exposed to the two million people that watch it live on the Sunday night. So we decided to go ahead. Um, and it was actually like a fantastic thing to do. Like it was really fun. We were there, me and the two guys that I started the business with, we were like best friends. We had to have models walk into the studio with us and they were just three of our friends. So it was just hilarious, like mm -hmm. the whole experience. Um, when we actually got into the den, we, we got like, as you can see in the video below, we got tore apart. <laughs> and there were some horrendous <laughs> comments, but um, it, it was still fun. Yeah. So it's and good. we, yeah, like the, the press we got afterwards was fantastic. We obviously saw an increase in sales and an increase in traffic. So, um, yeah, the whole experience was awesome. Good on you for going for it. When you talked, you touched on that thing about failure. I actually came across something the other day that talked about failure and defined it as failure isn't falling down; it's not getting up afterwards. And I think you've obviously proven that that's the point. So really, you didn't fail. So that the the speech marks around the word failure are quite appropriate there. So, what is it you enjoy most about what you do, Tom? That's a very good question. I think I enjoy the, the one thing that I enjoy most about what I do is helping people. Mm -hmm. And I used to think when before I was exposed to entrepreneurship or business that people in business didn't help people. I used to think they just took money from people. And I started to research money and research the thing that money represents, the value. And I, I realized that you will only be able to sell something if the person that you're selling to believes that, that thing has a greater value than the money that you charge for it. Mm. So this means that when a transaction occurs between a business and a customer, there's actually a surplus of value that's created in the world. Uh, it's quite hard to get your head around that. But So therefore, whenever someone comes to the platform and hires a team member and they work together and, and it helps them with their business, I believe like the world is like a, on a very tiny scale, but a slightly better place. And it's that process of creating something that will help people and actually helping people that I, that I really like. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's, that's a superb explanation of what it's about. And I think you, you really hit the nail on the head of the misconception of people there. So what drives you? Good question again. Mm. Now I think, so I think there, there are a number of reasons, some more noble than others. Yeah. I know there's definitely like my ego really seeks like the validation of others. Like, for example, this interview, I can take this interview and share it on my social media channels. I can send it to my friends. I can send it to my mum, and they'll probably think, oh, that's, that's good, Tom, you got, you got interviewed. And my ego will gain some sort of recognition from that fact. So like, I know that that probably won't bring lasting fulfillment or happiness, but that's definitely a reason why I do things is for the recognition for my ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, but there are, there are other reasons. Mm -hmm. As we just discussed in that past question, helping people. And I think that's a more sort of that will provide greater fulfillment and happiness in the future is by helping people. Yeah. So, the ego validation, the adding value to the world. Um, and I think the third and most powerful reason that 
I'm driven is to be able to build up value for myself uh, in, in the term, like in the form of assets or money that I can then in the future invest into making the world an even better place. Mm-hmm. So if you look at people like all of the richest people in the world now are giving their money away to charity, like absolutely amazing what Mark Zuckerberg has just done by pledging 99% of his fortune to a charitable foundation. That's exactly what I see myself doing in say 10 years. If I manage to amass wealth is to use the skills that I've built to create that wealth, to give that wealth back to the world in a method that I think is valuable. Awesome. So how do you relax when you aren't working in your business? I like, I think there's two ways. There's interacting with people completely outside of the business world. So people that are potentially not, well, definitely not involved in your business and potentially not involved in business at all. And so just being present in that interaction and like laughing and having fun, I think is a great way to recuperate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the method number one. And method number two is through use of the physical body. So becoming present through, for me, is running or weightlifting, I think provides a massive sort of amount of recovery from the, the intellectual sort of hassle, not hassle, but the intellectual strain that you go through uh, when building a business. So, Tom, are you ready to now go back to the t- and think about the time before you were an entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. So what difficulties did you have to overcome when you started your business? If we talk about the, the leggings business, we, we had no idea what we were doing. Like if we didn't, because none of us had started a business before, one of my co-founder, Joe, had a degree in business, but me and Luke didn't. Mm. So we had none of the skills required to both build the product, but also to sell the product. Mm. So we, like our issue was obviously wanting to try and put the product out into the world. But in order to do that effectively, we had to develop the skills. So instead of sort of splitting our time between developing the skills and actually implementing to try and sell the leggings, because we were working full time, we didn't really spend time to develop the skills. We just tried and sold the leggings. We just tried to sell the leggings. So this meant that our early efforts were not rewarded. And it was we had a very long learning curve because we didn't invest our time intelligently. So what, what I would urge anybody to, if they're starting a business, like without any experience, is to be intelligent about how you spend your time between executing and developing the skills required to execute effectively. But you also don't want to go to the other end of the scale where you spend all your time, say, learning to code or learning to copyright without executing. So it, the, the, the tip that I'm giving is to just be aware of where you're spending your time and to adjust as necessary. Mm, that's great advice, Then, And did you have any doubts that delayed you starting your business? With, with the leggings, we no, we didn't. Because we, like as I mentioned, there was a week between the idea to the implementation of the market store. Mm. So there wasn't any doubt there, but I think that was because we had other motivations. Now, if I, I, I think this is like a really advanced, or not an advanced, a really useful concept to harness, is that whenever you're considering, when you're weighing up the options to do something, if you can... Uh, if you can choose to do something where you would win regardless of the result, then that's really useful. So I'll give an example of a podcast that I'm just starting for this platform that we, ju- that we discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. Now, the result of a successful result of that podcast would be us 
at gaining clients by uh, doing this podcast, which that's the result. But mm -hmm. I've also engineered the podcast so that I win regardless because the podcast is just 10 minutes a day, like summarizing our progress and also talking about the obstacles that we've overcome. So that podcast also doubles as a sort of accountability tool for myself. So I know that each day I have to record a podcast, so I need to do something. And also, it enables me to teach things, and I think the best way to learn things is to teach. Mm -hmm. So there's those two other factors that I, like, I'm going to experience the benefits from, regardless of whether the podcast gets clients. So with the leggings, we actually wanted to have a market stall on that market in, in East London because we knew there was loads of attractive girls on that market, and we wanted to kind of do that, right? <laughs> so... If, if you can choose to do something where there are multiple benefits, regardless of whether you make sales on the market or you get clients from your podcast, then that's, <laughs> then that's awesome. Do, do that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what mistakes did you make that slowed your journey? Okay. I'm not sure didn't make any. Yeah, no, I've made so many mistakes. Um, well, okay, so well, like, your biggest one. Though. Yeah, yeah, I've got it right. So, as I mentioned, we we spent about six months building this platform, and I was in Venezuela, and it was Saturday, and we were due to launch the platform on the Monday, and on that Saturday there was some malware. I got an email from Google saying there's some malware on a separate website. So I found a contractor I'd worked with once before to, and I say, can you just sort this out? Because our website was live and was making sales. So I wanted to fix that. So we, I enabled this contractor to go into the hosting, the shared hosting account that I have that has all of my web properties. Um, though the contractor didn't know this. So he took a backup of just that one site that he was supposed to fix and cleared out all of the files for every other web property that I had. Mm -hmm. And for them to contact, contacts, I spent like the last three years trying and failing with online businesses. So I probably had like six websites live through that account and he just deleted them. Mm -hmm. um, the company HostGator do provide weekly backups for every account that they have. It's like complimentary. But... It didn't run for a month before because I was over some limit with the account. So we'd effectively just lost the previous three months of development work and my personal blog that I'd been writing on for, for nine months. Now, I think I could have probably taken that in a couple of ways. I could have got like really angry and tried to sue the contractor or, and just like given up. But, and I definitely wanted to do that. But the, I think the way I took it was quite mature in that I sort of took full responsibility. It was my fault for letting that person inside the account when I didn't really know his capabilities um, and for not ensuring that we did have backups of everything in there. Yeah. So that, so like taking that responsibility has meant that now I'm pretty sure I'll never make that mistake again. And it just delayed the development or the release of that platform by a month, six weeks. And now we're up and running and everything is fine. So I think the moral of the story is that on, on a, a journey to anything, on any journey, you're going to make mistakes. And yes, you should do everything within your power to prevent making them. But if you do make them, regardless of what the situation is, I think it's useful to take full responsibility and just make sure that you learn the lesson so in the future you don't make it again. Yeah. Did you manage to get your websites back? So, in short, no. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's a website, I think it's called archive.org. Mm -hmm. And if you go on that website, it takes, it takes full saves of websites to get any traffic to them. Really? Yeah. So you might actually be able to get some of it back. That's an awesome tip. I'll check that out later today. Yeah. I, it's, it might be, all, it's, I think it's archive.org or archive.com. I can't remember what it is, but it, mm. it definitely does it because I've used it recently for something else. Awesome. Okay, so, Tom, so now what I'd like to do is just talk about the entrepreneurial journey itself with you, so just moving forward from the beginning. In your business, how important is culture, and do you think it's something that's important from the beginning? 
how would you define culture? Culture is how you, I'm defining that as something as the way you treat your staff and the way you incentivize and incentivize and motivate people and how you just general, you know, the vibe of where you work, I suppose, or the, the environment you create. And that's the type of thing I'm talking about. So, yeah. so for example, you might start up, some people would start a business and they might just employ somebody and, and say, here's the job, go and do it. Whereas someone else might start, might employ somebody and they might have a manual and give them all these instructions on how to do it so that they, they know how to do the job properly. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. So a book that I love about this is called Start With Why yeah. by Simon Sinek that people have probably heard about. He has a 17-minute TED Talk that just talks you through the book. So if you don't want to read the book, just find the TED Talk. Um, so he says that everything is more effective if you start by explaining the why. So if you start your advertisement for your business, explaining why you exist, if when you hire a new employee, and you're, you're training them on your business, you explain why you exist and why you do what you do. And because I think when, when people connect with the why or they understand the why, they are far more empowered, if that's the right word. They're far more, they can, they'll be far more motivated in order to pursue that why as well. So if you look at the leggings company, our why is that you should be able to wear what you want as opposed to what you should. Um, and so we sort of lead with that on our website and on our social media channels. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we have been successful is because people, our customers, connect with that why mm -hmm. and become more engaged. If we then talk about this platform that I have launched now and our why, so our why is to sort of enable entrepreneurs to build businesses. Um, and I have discussions with everybody I bring into our team about that and about why they would, would want to connect with that. And that is a big part on who I would recruit and who I, ha I have recruited is people that agree with that sort of why and that mission. So in answer to your question, I think that culture and the why is crucially important for any business. Mm -hmm. and, to, and the reason it is so important is because its ability to motivate. Right. Yeah, that's, that's great. Just actually, just one other question I, I, I forgot to ask you before, which would be a right to ask you, which is what are some of the things that you did before you started your business that would be helpful tips for some of the listeners who haven't yet taken the first step of the entrepreneur's way? I think it's to be curious. So as you go about your day to day life, is to become aware and be curious about problems and the pain points that these problems solve. Mm. I think possibly the worst thing that you can do is to create a product without being aware of the problem that you're solving because then you could spend a long time or a lot of time or resources on creating the product when it's not actually solving a problem. So if you flip that on its head and you, and you, you go about your day-to-day -day lives, like when you're at work, when you're in the shops, when you're with your friends, and you're just aware of potential problems. And if you find one that you think is viable, invest more time into understanding that problem. And then you start a business and create a product that directly solves that problem, you're going to reduce your, the risk of starting the business. Mm. So I think the key is uh, awareness and curiosity. Knowing what you know now, is there anything that if you'd known it when you started out would have helped you to shortcut the learning curve? Good question. I think it's what we just discussed, what we, what I just mentioned there is with the leggings, we didn't have a problem in mind when we created that business. With the outsourcing service company, I didn't really have the problem in mind when I started that business. The marketplace that we have now, before I decided to go ahead and create that, I spoke to about 10 entrepreneurs that were using, that were hiring virtual staff. And I talked to them about their problem and their pain points, and, and I've then tried to solve them. So, again, it, in order to reduce the risk and thus the amount to reduce the amount of time or money that you will lose by starting a business, is to make sure you've spoken to people that will, by, 
buy your service before you product or service before you create it. Mm. Okay. That's pretty sure. Okay, thanks for that. And how much does gut feeling influence your decisions in your business? Good question again. I I don't trust my gut feeling. I'm not sure if you should or not. I don't think I can provide an opinion on that. But mm. if I have a gut feeling, I try to sort of become aware of that feeling and then try to intellectually understand where, where it's coming from and why it's occurring. Mm. Um, and maybe that is not like a good strategy to try and intellectualize the truth because the gut feeling I believe is probably is the truth, but the way I've done it previously is to is to not trust that mm. feeling. Okay. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer, really. I think some mm. people do and some people don't, and some people do a, the sort of thing you're talking about there. So it's just interesting to see how different people see it. So thanks mm. for that, Tom. Life is made up of constant change, whether we like it or not. So the, un the only constant in life, as far as I see it, is change. So, mm -hmm. Tom, how do you try to keep up with change? That's great. Um, I'm really glad that you raised that, actually, because it's something that I've only really discovered in the past six months or really got with that idea within the past six months. Um, and I actually finished a book recently where it said there were three constants in life, and one of them mentioned was change and the other two were humor and paradox that book is the way of the peaceful warrior which is an awesome book by the way so your question is how do i keep up with change yeah i'm going to give or the answer i'm going to give is meditation so i believe that when you meditate you enable yourself to or or you're building your skill, building the skill of creating positive emotions where like they're not connected to your external environment. So that means that regardless of change, you can still be happy because you can cultivate that happiness yourself if you build the skill set of meditation. So that is how I it's not why I started meditation, but it's what I've realized after meditating for six months is that even if I'm in a really rubbish place, the business is going really bad, I can sit for 10 minutes in the morning and still feel good and happy about life through this skill set that I build up. Mm. That's a, an interesting question, answer you've given me there, Tom. I've not heard that one before. That's awesome. <laughs> What is your favorite book on entrepreneurialism, business, personal development, leadership, or motivation? And can you tell us why you have chosen it? I might give a couple here. Okay. The, the, the first is for someone who doesn't like the theory or like the spiritual side and someone who just wants to build a business that will create a lot of value and ultimately make you really rich, it's called the Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DeMarco. And this is a guy who like dropped out of college, just had loads of small rubbish jobs. And then he sat for six years in his bedroom building a website that would connect people that wanted a limo with limo companies. Uh, and he eventually sold that for like hundreds of millions. And now as a millionaire, just writes books and relaxes. So he just talks you through exactly how he did that and the mindsets that he needed to do that. So for me, like in terms of the tangible, like get money books, that for me was the one that has really, that made the most difference. Um, so that's for someone who just like wants to go out there and do it. In terms of the more sort of intangible or spiritual side, I would say Seth Godin's book, The Icarus Deception. And in this book, he talks about, I'm sure you're aware of the, the, the myth, the Greek myth of Icarus, mm -hmm. where the, there was a man who was banished to an island and his son attempted to fly from the island back to the mainland. I'm probably, getting, I'm probably butchering this story, but 
So his dad, uh, the dad, like built some wings out of feathers and wax. And he told his son before he left that he shouldn't fly too close to the sun because the heat will melt the wax and it will fall and drown. And what he also told his son, but it's not retold in the myth, is that don't fly too low to the sea because the salt will mess up the wings and then you'll drown. So what actually happens is the sun flies too close to the sun and drowns. But the interesting thing that Seth writes about in this book is that that myth is retold without the, the fact that the, son, that the dad explains to the son that he shouldn't fly too low. So what he's saying is that everybody in the world is told through this myth not to fly too close to the sun and not to take risks and not to like follow your passion and to build businesses and to help people. And, but what was actually told in the story that you shouldn't fly too low either. So you, so you need an e easy medium. And that's what that book is about. And that was the book that made me decide to leave the corporate world. Everyone, when you have a busy life, then listening to audio books is a great way to expand your knowledge in the time when you may be doing other things, such as driving or when you were at the gym. We have a special offer for you of a free audio book of your choosing. To choose your free audio book, go to www.freeaudiobookoffer.com. As long as you've not already signed up, then you will qualify. So that's www.freeaudiobookoffer.com. Can, can I quickly jump in there? Of course. So I think a, a lot of people spend a lot of time moving between place A and place B. Uh, and those two places are like your home and your work. And there's, if you add that time up twice a day, every day, it can add up to like masses and masses of time. And what you can do in that time, if you are interested in starting a business or like building a, a life that you enjoy more, if you don't enjoy your life already, then an excellent opportunity and the, the easiest thing to do is to use audiobooks as you go between those two places. Yeah. So thanks, yeah, thanks that. That. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. <laughs> Tom, are you ready now to fast forward into the future and mm -hmm. tell me your dreams? <laughs> yeah. Right. What one thing would you do if you, with your business if you knew that you could not fail? Good question. I would, one thing that I really want to test out with this platform is to make it invite only. Mm -hmm. So an entrepreneur can only create an account if they've been invited by a friend. And a team member can only create an account on the platform as well if they've been invited by a friend. Now, I think that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. I think it would actually increase the number of new signups we get, because when you get invited to something that's invite only, you're like, wow, I'm, I'm special. I think it would also increase the quality of the people on the platform because the, the people can only come on if they've been, been invited and that's assuming the person, the people who are already there are, are good, are awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's something, if I knew that I couldn't fail, I would do that. But I think I'm not doing that because I'm scared that it will reduce, it will actually reduce the signups. Yeah, but, but maybe I'll uh, toy with that in the future. Okay, good answer. Excellent. It's, it's always a dilemma, that isn't it? I've been in a similar position in the past of a business and never known what to do. Maybe try launching a an alternative one and trying it with that one. Mm, yeah, testing it out. Mm. What skill, if you were excellent at it, would help you most to double your business? Copywriting. Yeah. So putting words on a screen that will inspire people to act. And I, so that's a skill that I haven't developed and I just started doing that this week actually. So each morning I spend time handwriting really good sales letters and trying to analyze why they work because it's, it, I, I believe it's the same as selling face-to-face. -face. So if my business was a face-to-face -face business, like not online, then selling would be that but because that's not what i'm doing i have to sell through a computer screen with words or like you could do it with video as well but i'm not doing that at the moment that i think is the most crucial skill for anybody selling online yeah it is very powerful isn't it mm -hmm. in five years from now if a well-known business publication was publishing an article on your business after talking to your customers and suppliers 
what would you like it to say? That's a really good question. Uh, not just that as it will provide like good insight and value for the listeners of this program, but also I think that's a really good question just to ask yourself mm -hmm. in order to get good ideas and to get good answers. So that's awesome. Um, what would I like it to say? I would like it to say that Tom and Tom's team from Virtual Valley has enabled X amount of entrepreneurs to build businesses, successful businesses, and improve their lives where they couldn't have previously done that. Thank you. Do you have a favorite quote? And um, can you tell us how you've applied it? There's so many. Um, okay, so this is a quote originally from Shakespeare, and I, I'm not like don't take me for like a lit literary genius. This is the only Shakespeare quote I've I've ever enjoyed or no. But it was told to me through a video by a guy called Alan Watts, um, who is an awesome philosopher and author. And it relates back to our discussion earlier about change. And I'm going to try and uh, say it from the top of my head now, but I might get it wrong because it's quite long. And it also includes words that don't really make sense in our modern language. But here we go. Uh, the cloud cap towers, the gorgeous palaces, I all in itself will inherit and like a cloudless tangent faded leave not a rack behind i probably got that wrong mm -hmm. and i might look it up uh, i'm going to look it up after and i probably butchered that but what he's basically saying is that all these great things the cloud cap towers the gorgeous palaces um are going to dissolve with time and leave nothing but a rack behind and i'm not sure what that final part means but it what I take from that quote is that change is constant and that everything that you might value, like in your life, or like your possessions or your shoes, uh, do not, like, are, are eventually going to fall apart and that will not be there, which empowers me to focus on the things that I think matter more, mm -hmm. such as my time and relationships. Yeah. Awesome. And what is the best advice you would give to other entrepreneurs out of all the things you could give? If I had to give one piece of advice, it would be to not build something that people don't want. Is to, before you invest time and money into building something, speak to the people that will buy it. And if five people say they'll buy it, then, then go ahead. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty good advice, that. Otherwise, you've not got a business, have you? Mm -hmm. Everyone, if you didn't manage to get a note of Tom's favorite resource or his favorite books, you can find the links on Tom's show notes page. Just go to theentrepreneurway.com and search for Tom or Tom Hunt in the search box. Tom, is there anything else that you'd like to add about your business? Um, I like to have a, just a quick discussion going back to that point about being an entrepreneur and being self-employed. Yeah. So the reason that, or for me, the reason why I chose to build Virtual Valley was to empower entrepreneurs. And when you first start your business, you cannot be an entrepreneur because you, you potentially don't have the funds to employ people to do a lot of the tasks within the business. So the reason why we built Virtual Valley is to reduce the cost as much as possible to take on those first employees to do the task within your business to enable you to move from being self-employed, from move away from that job that you've created yourself to sitting above a system. And then the time that you spend is actually being an entrepreneur. And the, the book that really clarified this for me is called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, where he talks about the difference between being a technician and manager or an entrepreneur. So that is the goal of Virtual Valley is to enable people to become entrepreneurs. Okay. And that's the last thing I'd like to add. Thank you for that. Tom, it's been an honor having you on the show. You have really provided us with some useful insights into the entrepreneur way. And you've certainly inspired us all and given us a lot to think about. So thank you very much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, Neil, and I really, I think, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. What 
because I think the effect that you could have on potential entrepreneurs could be massive. Mm -hmm. And what if one or many people who were not going to start a business do so because of the inspiration that you provided and the effect that that could have like Mm -hmm. on the world? I think it's really good. Thank you. I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. I appreciate you coming on here. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Entrepreneur Way. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball.